Good afternoon, everybody. I have to say I'm particularly excited to come to this meeting because you're focused on challenge. And I'm sure all of us feel our challenges in our everyday business, but sometimes stepping out of the office and really focusing on what are the big challenges facing marketing, I know that's something that has uh, tumbled through my mind quite often on behalf of my clients and also on the businesses that I've run in the past. So I thought I'd share with you a challenge that really has been on my mind with the hope that it will provoke some interesting thoughts for you today and um, give you some interesting things perhaps to go back to the office and think about. So here's the challenge that's been on my mind. I think this slide builds. Marketing is broken. It sounds like a pretty big, bold thing to say, but if you take a look at what's going on in our industry and so much has changed swirling around marketing, very often people are still practicing marketing the way they always have. And in fact, that's the stuff we're good at, right? We know how to do that. And it's harder to have to make the changes necessary to respond to all the things going on. So I cite a McKinsey study, which I find really interesting because they talk to CEOs and they talk to CMOs. So the CMO is really struggling with, here are my assets, here's the team I have to work with, and I'm working really hard to deliver incremental growth. Except that the CEO is looking for transformational growth. And those are pretty different, and there's a gap. So I also think it's interesting, I think two weeks ago, the IBM Executive Center released a study having surveyed 1,700 chief marketing officers, CMOs, from around the world, about 64 countries. And what's so interesting there, and I'm sure it's on your mind too, is the top two things that marketers really feel challenged by is the whole social media space, what to do about it, and secondarily, the fact that media is now operating in so many channels. There's mobile, there's tablets. I only have so much budget. How do I divide all this? I seem to have to be everywhere. And what I think is interesting about the whole social media space is as marketers, we're really good with structured information. We do market research. We get our data in. It's very structured. Social media is the exact opposite. It is unstructured data, which is why I think we're at such a tipping point around what to do with all of this, why are we looking for patterns, how do I sort through all this. We have clients who say to us, I have two million people on Facebook. Is that good? What do I do with that? What do I do with that, right? So change is all around us. And in fact, my motivation to leave Glaxo and be a founding partner at Biology and really focus on why people buy what they buy is because in my experience, I do think marketing is broken. I have launched just as many products doing all the right rigorous things, and six of them are headed to market. One goes brilliant, and two fall over. It means there's something wrong. So one of the things we think that is going to continue to be important is that we have to go deeper as marketers, and we really have to dig in and have more meaningful insights. So from our perspective, it requires two things, right? Your insight has to be provocative. It's got to excite people. It has to get their arousal up. I have to want to connect to the insight that you're offering me. And it also has to be proprietary, even if that's just proprietary in the way that your business connects to that insight. But that's not going to go away anytime soon. And I would be curious later on talking to people, so often we go into companies and people say, here's our insight. And it's not an insight, right? An insight is something that causes people to take action. What do you know about your business? A million things. But what are the insights that tap motivation? And those are the things you're going to have to dig deeper and try harder to find in the future in order to connect to people, whether that's through social, whether that's through bought media, however you're communicating. So in simple terms, biology is in the business of rigorously understanding these deeper drivers of demand. And we do that for the simple reason, which is we are looking for competitive advantage to help our clients understand why people choose what they choose. It's an interesting space and one I encourage you through this conversation and, and afterward for yourself to begin to start to learn about this area. There's some very interesting facets of it for people to look through these lenses for their business. So let me give you a couple examples. This is a piece of research that was done at Baylor College of Medicine. And they brought men in and asked them to rank the attractiveness of a variety of women's facial photographs. Now, unbeknownst to the men, 
Half these photos had been retouched to increase the dilation of the pupil of the women in half the set of photos. And consistently, men were drawn to the women with the dilated pupils. The interesting thing is they couldn't explain why. They were just attracted to those women. Now, what the non-conscious understands about that is that our preferences around attractiveness and beauty are actually hardwired into our brain. And the brain knows that a dilated pupil represents sexual excitement and readiness. But the conscious mind is unaware that this is why I'm picking out these photographs. And I share that example with you because so often we bring people into focus groups and we do all these things and we want them to explain to us why. If you had asked these men and pressed them, well, tell me why. Why are you really attracted to the people in this collection? What they're going to give you is a rational alibi. They're going to tell you what they think they feel, what they think they're picking according to, right? It's a rational alibi. I'm trying to explain to you something that's happening in my non-conscious that I can't get in touch with. So look at another example. For most people, you'd be able to pick your father out from a great distance. And that's because there are so many cues coming into your non-conscious that are, in fact, very subtle around maybe it's the gait, the walk that he has, maybe the pace with which you know your father walks, maybe the way he carries his shoulders or the way the jacket hangs on him. But from a great distance, that's my dad, that's my father. I understand that in ways that people often have trouble articulating, well, how did you know that far away? That was your father. I just know, right? These are ways in which your non-conscious is active. And it leads me to this point, and what we're centered on at biology, is how people make choices. We have two active areas of our mind that are working simultaneously. We have a conscious, rational part of ourselves, which is a very important way in which we choose. And we have a non-conscious, emotional way in which we're making choice. And you can look in the literature and you'll find some varying numbers, but none of them will change the fact that the non-conscious is actually much more important to how we choose than our rational selves, as disturbing as that might sound, right? So the interesting thing for us at biology and for me as a business leader is all of the tools we have in marketing today for the most part are talking to our rational selves. We ask people questions, we engage with them in ways that we want them to explain to us why did you rationally do that when in fact we know that there's an awful lot of influence coming from the non-conscious. And that's a bit what we're going to talk about today. But I encourage you to have a look in this space. It is really quite profound from a neuroscience standpoint, what we understand about how the brain chooses. And, and right now this field is emerging. We are at the tip of this information. One of the things we are quite rigorous about at biology is being very clear this is a new science. We can get a little bit of understanding about this space, but it will be years and years and years before we understand how the brain truly functions. So I just want to offer you that caveat because we are quite careful about the tools we use and the extrapolations that we make for business around that. And this is um, an area that will just continue to develop as we um, progress in our marketing lives. So what's in the non-conscious? I'm distilling this down in incredibly simple terms because, as I said, the mind is a pretty complicated place. But from a marketing standpoint, what's interesting to think about is the priming of our memories and values and how that influences what we buy. Also, our emotional wants and desires, right? Tough space if you're operating there and trying to get a consumer to talk about their emotional wants and desires. And one of the interesting things about the non-conscious is you actually don't feel it working except in a couple occasions when you realize it's working quite hard on your behalf. And one of them is your intuition. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had plenty of data put in front of me running a business and said, I don't believe this. I don't know anybody that I can reach out and touch that would match this data, right? When you feel your intuition or you say, my gut tells me this is wrong, that's your non-conscious having something to say there in the background, right? And maybe the most dramatic one is our reflexes. You will have jumped away from the car, headed toward you, before you have consciously thought, there's a car coming at me, I should move, right? Because the non-conscious, in fact, works much faster than the conscious mind. 
Our conscious mind is kind of our executive function. It gets the headline news every day, if you will, but it's operating more slowly, and you will be on the sidewalk having jumped away from that car before you're aware of it. So I just share that with you because it's, an, it's a way for you to recognize your mind is actively working in two ways. And the problem here is that the consumer, or all of us, are unaware when we're making choices. I can't feel my non-conscious, but I certainly can feel me deliberating on price or whatever it is I'm deciding to do. And I'm just gonna fill in a question that people typically ask me, which is, well, which of these decisions does this apply to? And I wanna be clear, this is universal. Doesn't matter if you're buying a home or you're buying, you primed me with ketchup, ketchup in the grocery store. This is just how our mind works everywhere in the world, okay? So let's move a little bit into marketing. Forbes is a business publication in the US. Many of you may be familiar with it, but these are just some statistics in terms of the rate of new product failures, right? Virtually all new products get all kinds of market research, investigation, and budget spent on it before we bring it out to market because we're spending millions of dollars to launch these products. And right now, our methodology, as I mentioned, is really focused on the rational understanding and not the emotional non-conscious understanding. This is perhaps the most shocking thing that I walk around with in my head all the time. This is shocking. We work in an industry where this is our success rate. I mean, me included, I don't cast dispersions on anybody. This is our success rate. Shocking. Maybe something's broken. Surely for the collective intelligence of the people you meet working in advertising and marketing and the ways in which we investigate and interrogate our customers, our products, what are our features and benefits, we work so hard to have that kind of a success rate, I would like to have a little impact on changing that. And perhaps our tools are part of the problem. Not that they're all of the problem, but we have these mental models of how marketing works and the evidence in our success rates around the world are not very good. So one of the things we think about, and I'm gonna share one of our tools, and some of you may be surprised that I'm not here to show you pictures of the brain. At Biology, we work across a whole variety of methodologies. Our goal really is to take science and import it into business because when I worked at Glaxo and had the ability to work across R&D and marketing and packaging, one of the things I learned quite quickly was that science knows a whole lot about why people choose that has not seemed to have made its way across the hall to marketing. And so we look at a wide variety of tools, one of which I'm gonna show you today, and I'm gonna show you some data so that you can really understand how we're looking at this. But one of the things we're looking to do is to shorten the development time. We actually put quant into the process at a much earlier point. I mean, you might be surprised to find how early. Some of the quant tools that we're doing with clients are making a difference, and we're not in this spin of qual after qual after qual. Although, I'm a big advocate of qual, so don't take my comment to mean anything other than just the order effect of where quant is showing up, which is typically later stage after we think we've fully developed this concept. And the second thing I would say about some of our traditional methods is that they are very good at getting rid of the tails, right? The consumer can quickly tell you there's no way in the world I'm ever buying that. It's a dog, right? But I also think what's happened in our traditional research is it gets rid of the breakthroughs, that it brings us to an average, to a median, the safe concepts. And if you think about the kind of breakout growth people are looking for, we've got to have tools that are evaluating breakout ideas and not sort of bringing it down to the norm. And so this is really our area of focus. We are looking at how do we effectively accelerate the businesses that we work on and do that mindful of a lot of economic changes, a lot of marketplace changes. Some of our clients work in very hyper spaces and things are changing around them what feels like almost on a daily basis as opposed to a quarterly basis. So this is really what we're trying to attack. And so the first point I'd like to make under that is the idea that what you see affects how you change. If you doubt that, think about the last time your competitor did something that surprised you. I bet your business plan changed, right? because what you see affects how you change. And the way that that is relevant to this conversation is, are you looking at other sources of information? 
are you doing the same segmentation, the same focus groups? I have people who say to me at the end of a focus group, I didn't hear anything different, did you? I mean, why are you doing that focus group, right? Because that's what we do, that's how we work. And just be mindful that where you are um, looking right now is affecting how you actually change. How much do you have your eyeballs out around your business? The more you're surprised in the marketplace, the more an indication that you may not be broad enough in terms of how you are exposing yourself to the various options around you. Because here's really the fun part. Where you look affects what you see, as simple as that seems, right? The lenses you have to evaluate your business are affecting what you see and therefore what it is you think you need to do. And so I'd just like to challenge you a little bit to think about should you open up the aperture? Should you be looking a little wider and triangulating data and thinking about how well am I fashioning what I'm doing according to these many changes, none of which I seem to be able to predict on a regular basis, to just open your eyes to other ways to look at your business. And so the tool I thought I'd share with you in the interest of you know, going a little wider and thinking about your business is around relationships. And as a marketer, people have talked about brand relationships forever. What I want to talk to you about is quantifying that relationship. This idea that we are now connected to our consumer, our user base, whether you want to be or not, you're in a relationship with them. And if you are not measuring it, you're not managing it, right? So when people say to us, I have all this social media stuff, this stuff is coming at me faster than my people have any idea what to do about it, one of our recommendations is you're measuring your advertising, you're measuring your web page, you're measuring all these discrete tactics because you have the tools to do that. Are you measuring the relationship? And so we have been studying this area of relationship now for quite some time and building a lot of intellectual property literally around the world to understand what are the drivers of a relationship. And we've looked at everything from religion to great brands and done an awful lot of R&D um, through a variety of tools in neuroscience to understand what these drivers are. And I'm going to show these to you and it's the basis on which I'll show you some of the data in a moment. So we think there are 10 drivers of a relationship. We don't tell a brand that it's got to be good at all 10, but there are two things you need to know. What is your competitor good at? In other words, what is the connective tissue between that competitive brand and its user base if you intend to influence it? That's particularly important for people entering a new market or entering a new category to actually begin now to see the mesh. What is it that people are connected to in terms of my competitive brands? And then secondarily, what are your leverage points? What are the points under this relationship? Once you measure it, what do you strategically want to do about that? And tactically, what do you want to do about that once you begin to see this kind of pull apart? So I'm not going to take you through each one of these. You can see them up on the screen. These are five of them. And um, one I think I want to spend just a second on is the idea of power from the enemy. Sometimes people are not as clear what that means. But basically, you're all familiar with the idea that you may be a challenger brand. Sometimes, even as a giant brand, and I'm going to show you this later on, you need to think like a challenger. You need to think about that leverage. And so this Microsoft Apple picture, which I think is now faded away a bit, they're friends a little more than they used to be. Uh, but it's a classic case of how you take power from your enemy and use it against them. And then a sense of belonging is one we're doing uh, with a lot of people in the social media space. How do you bring people into your franchise and congregate them in a community and a sense of belonging? This next one, or these are the last five. Evangelism is a step up from sense of belonging. So belonging is about having a community of people engaged with your brand. Evangelism means people will actively reach out and recruit others. They are so emotionally committed to your brand or what your activity is that they will reach out and tell other people. And recognizing that belonging is different than evangelism sometimes is very useful for brands to know. And then the last one here that I'll point out is vision. This is not the vision that we all write down on our strategic plan. If we stop one of your consumers on the sidewalk and say, what is the vision of this brand? Can they answer the question? I think 99 out of 100 brands their users cannot do that. And so if you're going to have somebody connect to you in a relationship, how do you connect to something that you don't have such clarity to say what the vision of that brand is, 
right? I'm not going to follow anything that I don't know where it's going. I don't know about you. But that's another interesting one that brands are finding more challenge around helping the consumer understand the vision. So now I'm going to show you a test. And these are, I can make these results public for two reasons. One is we paid for this research. And we're also showing you this at the master brand level. So you can see the brands up here. And had I been showing you a test on Apple, it might have been iPhone, iPad, et cetera. Right? But these are at the master brand level. I'm going to show you results against these 10 drivers for these technology brands. And what you're looking at, and we do measure the conscious as well as the non-conscious because they both matter. And you want them to be in sync on your business. So here are the results consciously asking people about these drivers and where these brands fall. Now, one of the things we see consistently is on the conscious side, the consumer doesn't discriminate among brands in quite the way you might expect. But what I'm going to show you next are the non-conscious results, and the scale does not change. But the results do. And Apple and Google stay up there pretty high, and the rest are dropping. Okay? Now, there are a couple interesting things I'd point out here non-consciously. Look at mystery for Google. Now, if you're Google and you're in search and maps and all of that, you don't want any mystery, right? You're the ultimate transparent brand, and that's what we see in these results. Transparency, no mystery, right? You also see how close they are on things like vision and storytelling between Apple and Google. And we have said to Google, you have an opportunity here to get your story. I mean, think about it. What is the story of Google? and articulate that in a way to get ahead of Apple in a very meaningful way. But that requires some work to do that. You see where HP is here. Hewlett Packard is probably the most transactional brand on Earth. They have brilliant distribution. They compete very aggressively on price. But based on these results, they don't have a lot more going for them. They're one of the largest technology brands on Earth, and they should have a relationship with their consumers, particularly given some of the things that they've decided to do around their company. They need to keep people following them. Right? So interesting ways in which when you are tapping what's in the memory of people, and you say to somebody, you know, consciously, what's the story of Microsoft? And they think, well, I just saw an ad. There was kind of a cute little story to that. I think their story is OK. Right? Non-consciously, what is the story of Microsoft? I don't know. I don't think the consumer knows either. We also do this work around the world. And so I'm showing you an example of four countries where this research was conducted. And so what you begin to see is, how do you think about your brand globally? When you have the relationship in a developed market that's very different than an underdeveloped market. So look at Google and China. Okay you see that they are having issues in China. And you've read about those in the media. They've made some choices in China, and they're not doing as well. But what you begin to be able to do, particularly if you have a centrally located team, is to say to the US team who markets everywhere, this is the US relationship everybody in the room understands, but you're not in the same relationship as elsewhere in the world. And now you begin to allow people to manage the business globally. We also have clients that are using this for tracking. So annually, they are repeating this work so that they can understand and the choices they've made around these drivers. How do we continue to track and know that we're making progress in the right direction? And if I had compressed that previous chart down into this simple, what is the order effect here? Look at mystery for Japan. What we would say is, that's pretty interesting to the Japanese. And mystery means puzzle. It means leave a few details out. You know, we're not so good at that as marketers. We want to tell you everything about our brand. But the intrigue and the way you can build some mystery and excitement with people sometimes is to leave things out. Let them fill things in. And if we were um, doing this in Japan, we would say, from a tactical standpoint, look for ways to engage people through mystery. It doesn't work in the rest of the world according to this. But perhaps Japanese culture, people are very engaged with that around puzzling and things like that. And there's a way for you to do that. And then you can also see how these other drivers line up, where you can get global strength behind a couple of them when you're beginning to choose which drivers you think are most important for your business. I'm just going to talk about Microsoft for a second to make a point here. And if you look at Enemy and where they rank, one of the things that we know about Microsoft is they're having a heck of a time with Bing. 
Bing against Google is a very big priority for them at Microsoft. Look at the spending on Bing. It's not sustainable. Even if you're Microsoft, it's not sustainable. And the problem is, up against Google, they also have limitless assets. So what to do? And in this particular case, we think one of the opportunities they have, and this is very hard for them, is to take on a challenger mentality with Bing. You are not going to meet Google head on head and be able to make that product a success. And so this is an example of where when you get deep inside this data and start thinking about how does this affect my franchise, you have some leverage. And then the last thing I want to show you on this study is in addition to the 10 drivers, we also test attributes. And what you're looking at are standard attributes within this technology group of brands that they test on an annual basis. And I'm sure many of you annually test your attributes. Where is your brand at the moment? And our tests were quite fluid to put any attribute in that people want to test. I'm going to back up a minute here. In all of the work that we do at Biology, we consistently test the attribute of cool. And I'm going to show you some results here and why that's important. But category after category, as we're going around the world and talking about attributes, we are finding cool to be an extremely strong motivator, particularly in categories you would not expect. So let me talk about cool for one minute just to give you a definition. And when we say cool, what are we talking about? And the most interesting thing about cool is it actually has a very unstable definition. If I went around this room, I think many of you would have used very different words to say when you call something out and say, that's cool, what do you mean by that? And so in simple terms, we think about it as something that creates um, excitement. It gives you a look at a possibility, something you would have never thought of before. It breaks conventional boundaries, right? And it connects to culture. And it has real badge value, and I mean that generally, real badge value, when people connect to something that's cool in terms of how it influences our self-esteem. So we are beginning to find through our neuroinsight work that cool is really mattering in a lot of categories. So if you look at the scores on these attributes across the companies I just shared with you, look where cool is. And I can tell you for two very big players here, their response is, we don't care. We have that same data. We could fill this room with the number of studies that we've done that says cool does not matter, right? But here's what I want to tell you. Cool operates like laughter. It lives down in the non-conscious. It's like, think about if I gave you a joke, you said, I don't get it. And I explained the joke to you, it's no longer funny, right? Cool lives down in your non-conscious. You know it when you see it. But if you ask me, did you buy that laptop because it's cool? No, I bought it because it's a really good price, and I'll give you one or two other things. And then I'll say, and it is cool, and I like that, right? But I don't feel too good about telling you for $3,000 or whatever the equivalent is that I bought a laptop just because it's cool. But here's the interesting thing that we did. We took brand favorability that we measure non-consciously, okay? So these companies believe the cool is at the bottom of the list of these attributes. When you lay over non-conscious favorability, something else happens. And here's why I think this is. Most of these companies, I trust they make a good product, right? All these attributes to the right, they're all good enough. I have now the ability to discriminate on something that maybe sits as high as value on this chart. And you go back to the drivers because we have that information. Where did all these brands fall on the drivers? So if Microsoft in particular said to us, OK, I believe you. I want to be cool. These are the two drivers they need to focus on. Vision, because Microsoft is so ubiquitous. If their vision isn't something cool, you're not going to get me to cool on one of the items. They have got to have a vision that people think is very cool. And grandeur, because it operates on such scale. Grandeur can be ubiquity. It can also be scale in terms of, you know, think about um, things that sit at great height or enormous billboards in a square. That, those two drivers will get them the most. And I would personally tell you that we've looked hard at all the symbols. They have over 135 symbols in Microsoft. They might as well have none. Nobody can hold in their mind 130-some symbols. So symbols is probably also something that they need to be able to have cool iconography that people can attach to in terms of uh, Microsoft. 
So just a, a brief moment on the methodology here, because some of you are probably sitting here saying, well, how did, how did she do this test? This particular test is done online. We have taken a um, tool out of science. This is the least contested, or to say another way, the test that people in the social sciences have the greatest confidence that you are tapping the non-conscious, and it's IAT testing, or latency response, okay? So this is built on that platform, and then we've built our analytics on that. So we have consumers around the world who take this right at their laptop. We also have companies who are doing this as central location testing because they want someone to taste something and then take the test or try a product and then take the test. But the methodology here is quite simple. I'm going to explain forced choice, and then you can see there that we include the 10 attributes in addition to our drivers. So if I asked you right now to quickly tell me, and I mean quickly, whether you prefer chocolate or coffee. For those of you who like both, like me, I have a hard time deciding that. But if you never ever drink coffee, you're gonna quickly hit chocolate, right? The speed with which you answer, and this is being measured in milliseconds off of your computer, the speed with which you answer is the confidence of your answer, okay? Now, here's the important part. It takes a certain amount of time for a thought when you say, I'm trying to remember that. It takes a certain amount of time for a thought to move out of your non-conscious into your conscious. This test operates below that threshold, and that's how we know that you have given a non-conscious answer, and this test is then built on non-conscious choice. So in this simple test, you would have been shown a pair around Microsoft versus Google, but all those pairs rotate, including order effect. So you're seeing multiple pairs, and you are very quickly having to answer. Part of our technology, just for those of you thinking through the science, is that we're actually calibrating the clock speed on that laptop wherever it is in the world so that the timed answer can be um, equivalized across uh, different test takers. So we think this is a very interesting tool, this particular one, around being able from a onslaught of social media to think about what is the relationship that you're in with your customer. How do you measure that? How do you get your arms around that? And not just think individually about, I've tested my advertising, I've tested my website. What is the compilation of all of that adding up to? And is your relationship stronger than your competitor or not? I can tell you one of the companies on that previous chart was pretty unhappy about where they fell. And this was a very different lens for them to begin to think about, so how do I change the outcome of this and actually leverage my relationship in a different way? Um, just very quickly, I want to tell you that you know, we also use this for packaging and concept testing. It's a different test, but it's operating off of this same platform because, again, we are finding that in terms of concept testing, people are loading things into the concept until I have enough in there that it's actually going to win the test. And we have some different approaches to concept testing and packaging testing to ensure that you're looking both consciously and non-consciously at what's happening. Because if you think about it, the amount of time people spend at a retail shelf is more consistent with non-conscious choice than conscious choice. I mean, much as we would love it, people are not standing there in front of our shelf sets very often and deliberating what they should buy. Right? It's happening very quickly. Some people claim they don't even slow down the cart and they reach out and grab for what they're getting. And I just want to leave you with this point as well, which is emotions really saturate decisions. I have found through the years um, heartbreaking, brilliant creative left on the cutting room floor for advertising because it didn't test well. Right? and other ways that you're looking at creative things that are happening. And when we ask people to rationally explain some of this, we are getting very limited views. Emotions saturate our decisions. And so one other thing that we do that um, I wanted to share with you, and you may be doing this in your own business, um, but the power of images to understand and make meaning. Um, all of you probably realize that Two things, I guess. One is when you are preparing a package, if you put more text on that package than graphic, you're keeping the conscious mind very busy and the non-conscious mind is out of the equation. You have to have a balance of text to visuals if you want to activate both because there is a lot of meaning 
being absorbed by people visually. So one of the things we've done is we've gone around the world and we've built an image bank. And we know the meaning of all these images that we have in the bank. And we know how they do in Japan versus Brazil versus the UK, et cetera, as a way to deeply understand diagnostically when we do a concept test, we include our images and ask people to sort. And so you would get something like this. So we now begin to understand why did they pick those images for concept one and not concept two, and what's happening in the polar bear image, which is actually an experience of awe, where there's a shrinking of self in the presence of something grander. And in this case, it's the child and the polar bear in the aquarium who would never have a chance to press her face so close to that animal. And how we start to understand what's going on non-consciously when we are activating images and how potent those can be for us running a business. So I would ask you to think about in the context of this conversation, is your innovation, whether that's innovation in your advertising, innovation on your brand fundamentally, is it as productive as you need it to be? Is there a reason for you to begin to look a little wider to think about other types of information that might be able to give you benefit on your business? Because from what we see, category after category we work across, there is a first mover advantage here. There is a learning curve. And one of the reasons people engage with us at times is to be able to learn this space. But you don't have to engage with us to learn that space. You, you can certainly look into the literature and do reading and find a lot of things here that would be of value to you. And that's an action I hope I can recommend to you, that if this is really brand new to you, don't let it stay new for long. You have much to learn, and there are resources available for you to do that. Even if you just do that as a perspective about your business and don't go all the way to this kind of testing, it's just a very, very powerful space around consumer motivation. And if your competitors get there and you don't know anything about that space, we've already seen where that's giving people advantage in how they portray their brand in the marketplace and connect through a relationship. And so with that, I'm going to close um, and hopefully have left a little bit of time for questions, but I hope I've given you some stimulating things to think about here today.